Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the previous episode, we wrote a compute shader that constructs a grid of rustoms which we can now use for light culling. Today we'll add a new compute shader to test whether a light intersects a frustum and if so, put the light index in an array which we can later use in the pixel shader for lighting. I will also explain the steps we need to take and which buffers we are going to use for light culling. Let's start with fixing a bug that causes a crash when we resize a window like so. Looking at the output panel, we see that the crash is actually a failing assertion, which for some reason that's unknown to me, crashes the application instead of causing a debug break. And that happens when we assert that the dimensions of the created swap chain buffers are the same as the window size. As you can see, the window size is updated here. When the window was resized and the user is no longer holding down the left mouse button, which indicates they are finished resizing the window. However, because of this async function, sometimes we resize the swap chain before the window size was updated and that's causing the problem. If we use the regular function in set, the swap chain will be resized after the window size has been updated. We can see this clearly when we set breakpoints. The breakpoint in window size update is hit first and the one where we resize the swap chain is hit later. This next one is not really a bug, but it does bug me when it happens and that's when I press the Alt key or F10 key. Doing so halts the message loop that calls the update function and as a result, it stops the entire application. And the reason is that pressing these keys would activate the application menu, which we don't have here, but nevertheless will cause this behavior to happen. The easiest way to handle this is by catching window messages for these keys in the message handler and return zero, which lets the operating system know that we already handled the message and it won't pass it to the default message handler. Now when I press F10 or the Alt key, nothing happens. I'd like to fix a couple of typos next, starting here where we are accidentally passing a copy of the 3D12 frame in 4 instead of a reference pointer. So let's pass it by reference to avoid this unnecessary copy. And here in camera getter functions, we don't change any of the camera properties, so these references can be constant. And these were all the fixes that I had in mind. Feel free to let me know if you encounter anything that could be improved. That's always greatly appreciated. So today we are going to add another compute shader that will intersect the lights with grid frustums and so determines which lights are going to be used for each tile on the screen. And again, we are going to base our implementation on the code as explained here on 3D Game Engine programming site. You can find the link to this article in the video description. First, let me add a new shader file and name it calllights.hlsl. I'll change the credits so we can find where this came from. Our compute shader will take a set of system value semantics that are passed as parameters. We can copy these from the site as well. The code comment explain what these are, and if you'd like to know more, watch this video for an introduction to compute shaders, where I explain each one of these values. 
Note that we use this structure in shader code exclusively, so we don't need it when we are using this file in our C++ code. While we are here, let me also define the data structures for sphere and cone, since we are using those as bounding volumes for point lights and spotlights respectively. We use these bounding volumes to do intersection testing with grid frustums. A sphere is described using its center position and a radius, and a cone is defined by the position of its tip, its height, the cone's direction, and its base radius. So here we have our compute shader function, which takes compute shader input. Before writing this function, I'd like to go through the steps needed to call the lights and write the results in buffers that are used by the pixel shader. Again, I'd recommend reading the blog article as well, which describes this process in much more detail. For starters, we need to understand the role of each thread and thread group in the light calling shader. Looking back at the grid frustum shader, we note that the size of thread groups didn't have any particular meaning other than simply telling the API how many threads need to be executed in order to get as many frustums as we need to cover the whole screen. Each thread represents one tile on screen and therefore calculates the planes for a single frustum. In the light calling shader, however, a thread group represents one tile and each thread within the group will be a worker which will do intersection testing for the same frustum as the other threads. If we use the same group size as the tile size, then each thread also represents one pixel on screen. Using the images from the source material, we see that we have a buffer that contains an array of light calling light info with light position, direction, range, and so on, are basically all the data that we need for intersection testing. Then we need to have another buffer that contains the light indices of the lights that affect each tile. For example, here the first tile has three lights with indices 2, 1, and 3. The second tile has one light with index 0. The third tile has two lights with indices 5 and 6, and so on. This buffer can be used in the pixel shader to index into the light buffer and use only the lights that affect the tile where the pixel resides. However, when using only this buffer, we don't know where a tile begins and how many light indices it has. Therefore, we need another buffer, which represents a grid that contains this information. This grid has the same dimensions as the grid frustums buffer, since it has an entry for each tile. Each entry contains two integer values, the first of which contains the offset of light indices for this tile within the light index buffer, and the second integer is the number of light indices for this tile. For example, here we see that the first tile starts at offset 0 and contains three indices, the second tile starts at offset 3 and has one index, and so forth. We can summarize the light calling shader with these five steps. First, we need to initialize group shared data. Group shared memory is memory that can be accessed by all threads within the same thread group. This makes it useful for storing intermediate results that don't need to persist between frames. Next, we need to determine the minimum and the maximum depth values for all pixels within the tile. As I explained in this video, this will complete the six planes of the frustum, after which it's ready to be used for intersection testing with lights. To do this, each thread will take a light and intersect its bounding volume with the frustum that belongs to this thread group. So the first thread will test the first light in the buffer, the second thread will test the second light, etc., until we either run out of lights to test, in which case we are done, or we run out of threads. In that case, we loop through the buffer so that each thread can examine multiple lights if needed. When all lights have been tested for intersection with the group frustum, we end up with zero or more light indices that we need to write to the light index buffer. Before doing so, we update the light grid entry that corresponds to this tile with the number of lights and their offset within light index buffer. Finally, we write the indices to light index buffer at that offset. Okay, let's start writing our shader code. Here we can define these five steps.
Now we could write our code, but it's very important to make sure that all threads within the group are done with their work before proceeding to the next step. Otherwise, some threads could start working on a piece of data that's not entirely updated yet. To perform this synchronization, we can use a function that is called group memory barrier with group sync. There are a few different kinds of barrier functions for thread synchronization. This one is for synchronizing access to group shared memory. If you would like to perform read-write operations to a global buffer using multiple threads that would access the same address within the buffer, you'd need to use a different kind of barrier function. Let me also add the buffers that we need to work with. As always, we have the global shader data and the shader parameter buffers. We also need the grid frustums buffer, which now is a read-only shader resource, mapped to a T-register. In addition, we need the buffer that contains the calling info, which we simply denote as the lights array. This is the calling info array, which is managed by the 3D12 light module in our C++ code. Next, I'll add the group shared data, which will hold the intermediate results of this thread group. First, we need the minimum and maximum depth values in view space. These are floating point values that are represented as integers. I'll explain the reason a bit later in this video. Further, we have the light count, which obviously contains the number of lights that affect this tile. As I just explained, we need to write the light indices at the start offset within the light index buffer. For that, we need a group shared variable too and we need an array of light indices with a maximum size. This contains the indices that we are going to write to light index buffer at the end. Finally, we need to add our output buffers, which for now are the light grid and light index buffers for the opaque objects. Right now, we only support opaque objects in the engine, but we'll add buffers to handle lights that could affect transparent objects as well. That's why I skipped one register in order to leave room to attach buffers for transparent objects later. One buffer that I haven't mentioned yet is one that contains the total number of lights for all frostums. Since this is a number that needs to be updated by all thread groups, it can't be a group shared variable, but needs to be accessible globally using a dedicated buffer. We use the first thread in the group to initialize the min max depth and light count group shared variables. Because min max depth variables are integer bit representations of floating point values, I'm using the bit pattern for float max to initialize the minimum depth as an integer. You can use this online tool to examine the bit representation of any single precision floating point value. We don't have to initialize light index, start offset, and light index list array. I also add a couple of index variables which we can reuse for different purposes. This was the initialization step. After this group memory barrier, all threads can start working on the next step, which is calculating the minimum and maximum depth for the frustum. We do this by sampling the depth buffer. We use dynamic resource indexing to directly index into the attached resource descriptor heap and get the resource as a 2D texture. The shader resource viewer index of the depth buffer is provided in the shader parameters constant buffer. Remember that each thread also represents a pixel, so we can use the thread index to sample from the depth buffer. Since depth buffer has a single channel, we are only interested in a single value. This is a value between 0 and 1, which I'm going to transform to view space using the clip to view function and the inverse of the projection matrix. After this transformation, the depth value will be between the near plane and the far plane of the camera frustum, which is measured in world units. 
because we are using right-handed coordinates, the view space depth value is negative, which makes min-max comparisons a bit counterintuitive. For example, objects that are farther away from the camera have a smaller z-coordinate than the objects closer to the camera. To make things a little easier for us, I'll temporarily negate the depth value. Now if the sampled depth value is non-zero, it means that this pixel belongs to an object that was actually rendered and we can compare its depth value with the group shared min-max values. We use interlocked min-max functions for this, which are the same as regular min-max functions, except they only modify the group shared variable by one thread at a time. This way we prevent race conditions. These functions only work with integer values, and this is why we had to put the floating point depth values in integer bit representation. We can still compare these integers, because floating point values happen to have the same order in their integer bit representation. This means that if a floating point value A is larger than floating point value B, then integer bit representation of A is also larger than integer bit representation of B. This is all for min-max calculation, and I'd like to stop here for today. In the next video, I'm going to explain how we calculate intersections between spheres and frustums, and between cones and frustums. Then we'll continue and finish our light culling shader. As always, thank you for joining me today, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.